Before Guys, without right further ahead. ado, right in the Marvel world, the editor of some of the best comic books that I've ever read, Mr. Jim Shooter, is here live with us tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure. We have been talking about this for, I don't, I've been talking about coming here and talking to you for months at this point. And, you know, when I saw you in the hotel lobby, we had a small conversation about certain books yes. and certain things. At 25 years old, you were an assistant editor. Uh, no, before that. Right? Before that, that right? Yeah. How old were you when you started working at Marvel? Maybe 24. 24, okay. Actually, I had worked for Marvel a couple times before that, but just as a freelance. Yeah, okay. I went on staff in, in 1976. 1976, okay. So I guess, uh, yeah, it was 24. 24 at the time, right? That's unbelievable. Yes. Okay. Uh, was that something you always wanted to do? Were you always enjoying comic books? Is, I mean, yeah. was it... Well, it was. I, I needed to make a living. Yes, right. You got to work, right? Yes. You know, I mean, I was. Uh, my family, we we weren't very prosperous, and and you know, we needed the money. And, yeah. And, uh, when you, I was twelve years old, and I'm trying to think, what can I do to make some money? Right. Yeah. And they won't right. hire you down at the factory. You know. Yes, right. When you're twelve. Yeah. So, uh, and I had a paper, a big deal, a couple so dollars, did I. A couple so did dollars, I. couple dollars a week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, it occurred to me that somebody got paid for writing these comics. Okay. I thought, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're 12, you think you can do anything. Yeah, right, of course, of course. And so uh, so I uh, I spent a year studying just to yes. figure it out. Yes. Because I didn't want, I wasn't doing it for a lark. I wasn't yeah. doing it for fun. I wanted to try to make something I could sell. And when I was 13, I thought I was ready. And I wrote uh, a script, and I sent it into DC Comics. And it wasn't a script. I really didn't know what a script was. Okay. I, I, oh I actually God. drew every panel. You did. Best, best I could. Right, right, yeah. absolutely. And it wrote the dialogue yep. in and so forth. I made a cover for the thing. And okay. Sent it into DC Comics. And I get a letter back and it's from the editor there, Mort Weisinger. He yes. Was, he was the head editor. He was the vice president. Big deal. Okay. And no, That's uh, a big deal, though. No, no. Yeah. It was a big it's show. It's a huge you know? big deal. That's yes. what I'm saying. And uh, so uh, the letter said, uh, you know, this, you might have a future doing this. Why don't you send us another one? Gotcha. So I sent him two more. It was a two-part story. Yeah. And covers, laid it out, stuff, just the same as I did the other ones. And then I get a phone call from him. Okay. And he says, he says, we want to buy these three. We're going to publish them. No way. And now I want to start using you as a regular writer. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, he says, your first I'm going to give you assignments now. He says, your first assignment is Supergirl. Okay. He said, 12 pages yeah. by, by next Friday. I said, yes, sir. Yes, yes. So, so I delivered it, and they, they liked it, and they published it. They published everything I ever sent them. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, he didn't Eight know years. I was. I just turned 14. Gotcha. Right, right. Because it was 400 miles away. I lived yeah. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, yeah. yes. And so he thought I was a college student. Yeah, right. You know. Oh, my God. And so when he finally, a couple months into it, he, he, uh, he wanted me to fly up to New York, spend a week, go to the office every day. Stay at a hotel. He said, we'll pay for everything. I said, right. I said, uh, I'm thinking, like, how's that going to work? Yeah, right. How are you going to tell <laughs> your parents? 14 year old, yes. you know. Yes. And so he says, how old are you? Yeah. I said, well, I just turned 14. I just turned 14. And he said, he said, put your mother on the phone. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I put my mother on the phone, and she was on board. She thought yeah. was, that was all right. So. So I had to wait till school was out in June. Yeah. I had to bring my mother with me oh my on my God. first Look business trip. Oh, that my God. Awesome. You wow. know, bringing your mother with you on a business yes, trip right, is really right. kind of not cool. Yeah, you know? it's not cool. Not cool. Right. And, and so, but after that, you know, uh, first of all, uh, he, he was impressed that I was about a foot taller than he was. Yes. He had her. And second, I seemed to be, you know, okay. And so after that, I just went by myself. Did you really? Now, these days, a 14-year-old went to the uh, airport, and tried to get on a plane, and yep. fly to New York, and check into a hotel. New York City, yes. They'd arrest the parents. Yes, right, of yeah. course. You know, of course. But in those days, nobody cared. Yeah. You know, it, was, you know, it seemed normal. It right, seemed right. Fine. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I started. That's unbelievable. That's awesome. that's unbelievable. Before you leave, though, I do want to ask you this question. We talked about a little bit about it in the in our in our hotel lobby today, which right. made my day. I just want you to know that it was so oh. fantastic to talk <laughs> about talk to you about this. So, the death of Jean Grey, right, right, had to happen, right, right. It had to happen because she just killed a billion people, and putting her in a jail would just mean the X Men would have to go get her. 
Well, I mean, all no, X-Men no, fans, you guys need to hear this. You have to need to hear this. The thing is, it had to happen because Claremont said so. Okay. Wow. But what Claremont said you said so. No. Yeah, well, of course. He lied. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing is, like, like when, when it came to the end of that story, the, the build-up to the story, was the, the end of it was supposed to be that she would become a villain and remain a villain. She'd gotcha. Be, she'd be like the Doctor Doom for the X-Men. Gotcha. Okay? She said, stay alive. That was, yes. And stay, stay alive. alive. And, wow. and, and so the thing is, like, when, when, they, when Chris and John came to the end of the story, they just loved the character so much. They said, ah, we can't do it. And so they they, they, they copped out. Okay. And the yeah. end of the story, the way Chris wrote it the first time, was going to be that, well, the Shi'ar somehow fix her mind. And now she's okay. She can go back to really? go back to Westchester. Everything's fine. But everything's fine. <laughs> yes, everything's forgotten. It's all good. You know? <laughs> and I said, Chris, I said, I said, you know, forget morality and stuff like that. Yes. That's a lousy ending. <laughs> <laughs> you have anyway. built this to this incredible climax. Yes, right. And now it's, oh, it, it don't, doesn't matter. Everything's fine. Yes. You know, I Sorry. said, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so I was the one, and she, he said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, maybe she goes to Galactic Prison or something. Yes, okay. And he said, I don't like that. He said, the X-Men would keep trying to rescue her. I said, not on my watch. But, okay, uh, okay. I said, but, but uh, you know, all right, it's your turn. You come up with something. Okay. The next morning, he comes in, and he stands in my doorway. So he comes in, he comes, Chris Claremont comes in, and he says, editor-in-chief. I'm going to kill her. Really? <laughs> and I said, deal. That's a good ending. Oh, really? And he said, what, what, wait a minute. What, what do you mean? You you can't kill her. Yes. I said, no, you're going to kill her. Yes. <laughs> and so we get in this stupid argument, you know, and then he gets frustrated and he runs away. And 10 seconds later, the phone rings and it's John Byrne calling from Calgary. Yes. Okay. And he's, his first words were, are you out of your mind? <laughs> and I said, no, yes. Chris and I made a deal. Yep. Get to work. Yes. You know? Oh, <laughs> oh my God. God. Oh, and, so, oh, God. and so Chris, you know, for years and tell everybody, oh, that mean Jim Shooter. Man. Yes. Because, right. yes. yes. you know, it's, it was a, it was a lot. I was you know, right, right, right. escaping it's, responsibility. It's escaping sure. responsibility. And, and so finally, uh, there was a, a, an interview that was done on camera yeah. with Chris and it, it, Louise on one side and Anna Sent on the other yes. side. And so Chris starts. Louise to, Simonson. Louise so Simonson. Knows. He, and and, and yeah. Santi, who, yeah. who Louise trained. Yes. Okay. Very important editors, for all those people both listening right now. Editors yes. Both X Men editors. Yes. Both X Men editors for years. So anyway, Chris is telling the story of that mean Jim Shooter. Yes. You know? And so Louise. Turns to him, she says, "Chris, you know it was your idea." No way. <laughs> and then he says, "Uh, well, yeah." Uh, yeah you know, so he finally had to admit on camera. Really? And then he said, "Well, what if we're gonna do it? I figured we would do it right." Yeah. And they did do it. Right. Yes. Yeah, they, they knocked they it out of the. They park. knocked it out of the. They park. killed it. And, yes. they, and they put a little redemption for her at the end. It was great. Yes. And it took a high middle of the road book X Men. Yes. And it put it on top of the industry. It, it where absolutely it stayed did. for twenty years. Yes, hundred percent. I mean, yeah. we got viewers that's, fans that's all over here. I grew yeah. up in that. That's you know, good. it was one of my most iconic storylines to this yeah. day. The death of Phoenix, the Hellfire yeah. Club. It's just absolutely fantastic. But but let you me know. make it clear. So okay. It was all Chris and yep. John. Yes. Okay. All I did was tell them when they were when they were doing something stupid. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. And then they fixed it. Yes. That's good leadership. I love it. I love it. Leadership. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell them when they're doing something wrong. Tell them to fix it. Yeah, fix it, right? And look, they did it. And now we have two. Yeah. We have the black suit Spidey. Yeah. Right. We have you know Jean wow. Grey, one of the most yeah. iconic storylines ever. Yep. You know, that was great oh my stuff. God. Great. They Those guys were genius. They, they did yes. such great stuff. It was just yeah. I mean, what a great team you had. You yeah, know, yeah like, the best people. On yeah, that. you. I mean, I know I don't want to monopolize your time. I'm very respectful of that. Working for Stan, was it what, like when you saw Stan? Was he as 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 it, was he the embodiment of what you expected? Did he, you know, just a little bit about Stan. Well, you know? okay. First of all, you know, people think Stan's like a showman or a huckster. Correct. No, he's like that 24-7. He is. He's the energizer money. Yes. He, he was. He, and, right. and, and that was that was really his personality. He Correct. was that enthusiastic. Yep. Uh, this at one point, I never worked for Stan. Yeah. I never okay. had Okay, worked. right. Stan had been out of the comics for years by the yep. time I became editor. Okay, I apologize. Okay. No, yep. that's okay. Yep. But So he was doing the film and entertainment. Yes, 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 He was right. Marvel's face to the world. Correct. He, you know who wouldn't take Stanley's phone call? Correct. Right. Right. You know? right. And right. so he was busy with that kind of stuff. Spider-Man is and I, 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 I basically had his old job. Yeah. I, I was the new Stanley. So yeah. Ah, but think about it. Stanley is thirty feet down the hall. Yeah. If you got a question, yeah. you're gonna go ask him. Yeah. yeah right. For sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, he helped me all the time. Yeah. Like, I didn't care if he was on the organizational chart or not. Yeah. You know, he's Stan Lee. Yes, right. You right. Know, got a question, go ask yes, the guy. My God. And he helped me a million times. He taught me awesome. so much. He was he was, he was a, a, a Stan Lee that I could read. Yeah. As a kid and then I, I 
Chris Claremont, I'm, I'm, as a, as a, I'm a special education teacher now, but I have terrible dyslexia. I couldn't read as a kid. And the first books that I ever read were Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum's work. There you Dave go. Dave Cockrum, I met when I was 12 years old. I had him sign my extra 96. Great it's one of the books I covet it. Breaks my heart that he's not around. And we've lost so many great people. Yeah. You know, yeah. but all these people, all the people that you've worked with, you yourself, all the stuff you've done have shaped, shaped like so many of our childhoods with your direction. So well, we can't you, thank you enough. You, you, yeah. Stanley, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, the rest of them yes. did, did some wonderful things from my childhood. Yeah. I, if I could carry on that tradition, yes. even just a little bit. No, you absolutely yeah. did. Yeah. And just by telling us, listen, yeah. just by telling us these stories and talking to a bunch of grown men here, it is, you absolutely made my weekend. So, Thanks. Yeah. Mr. Jr., thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks, for joining us. So Ladies and gentlemen, the great Mr. Jim Jr. Jr. I saw your uh, podcast about this show. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Yeah.